the rest of the studio is lit like a 16 year old streamer would um so ed are you in london um i'm yeah i'm back in i'm I'm in the uk i'm about 30 miles outside of london so i'm in uh, yeah english countryside um and it's cold and gray and dark and english out there it's <laughs> uh, yeah the spring has spring's not come yet to to, to the uk it's uh oh, everyone's nice. feeling a bit sorry for themselves yeah i love that though I lo- that's why i love going to london because i just love it's raining and it's usually dreary and cold out and so you just drink and you know it clarages <laughs> welcome to beer net radio everybody it's your host harry shoemaker and i'm here with some equity analysts from jeffrey's we have ed mundy who is Managing Director of Beverages based in London. And we have Komil Gajawala, who's been on the pod before. In fact, fact, Komil was on the very first episode of our pod. Uh, We called it the, I think, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. It was during COVID. And uh, Komil is uh, also Managing Director of Beverages and Household Products and, you know, Health and Safety things that we we don't even want to talk about on this podcast but welcome gentlemen thanks for being on we're in a weird situation in the u.s beer industry that i wanted to talk to y'all about one it's kind of i was talking to jordan and jen on a previous podcast the other day and feels a lot like covid like the the year after covid because the comps are all weird and you know really you have to go and do a two-year stack on when you're looking at circana or Nielsen data to kind of get a gauge of really where we are. We're entering into a period now where Molson Coors, Yingling, Paps, they're all facing these tough comps and they're only going to get tougher throughout the summer. Molson Coors released their first quarter earnings, which of course was a beat. We all knew that. The real action now starts in April where they're already down. The industry itself is, is soft. It's going to be a messy summer discerning who's actually growing and who's not. So why don't we start with Molson Coors? Do you think they're they're going to make this zero to low single digit volume growth number for the year? That's their goal is growth on growth. Um, very rarely anyone's goal to do worse than that. Um, even if the number is, you know, slightly above zero or, you know, even if it's a low amount of growth, the, the real story, I guess, for Molson Coors from this point forward is how much the incremental investment will work. So they made a lot more money than they ever envisioned they'd be able to in 2023. And they're spending more. The returns on that spend are going to tell you the story about Molson Coors. It's going to be hard because at minimum, with ABI looking to right the ship, the cost of doing business has gone up. They're spending more money. So if it it really had nothing had changed, forgetting about comps, forgetting about last year, all you know is that a large, heavily resourced competitor is spending a lot of money. And it seems like more recently starting to deploy some of those capital into into places that that seem like they're working. You know, the mind shift has uh, really changed uh, around many of their brands. I think it's going to be tricky for most of course. If I were them, I'd do the same, say the same thing. All right, let's go for it. Let's figure this out. Um, but man, it's going to be hard, especially when AB is up there spending as well. And you know, and, and AB went through and uh, made a deal with the Teamsters. So we're, you, you got to assume that their labor costs are going to be higher going from here on out. You got to assume Molson Coors still has an ongoing strike in Fort Worth. That seems, from where I sit, it seems to, the disruptions seem to be minimal. So I don't know how that's going to turn out. But on the other hand, they're also not just cycling these big numbers for Miller Lite and Coors Light, but also for Simply. Those, those products have tough comps too. And some of them, like simply, seem to really be working. If you yeah. look at gains in distribution, obviously, Modelo's been at the top of most lists, but then right under that is simply. Uh, yeah. Now, was that enough for a portfolio composition shift where the overall business can grow faster? No, it's not that. It's not that big. And think about it, as successful as Chilada has been, how long it took before that became a really meaningful contributor for Modelo. But on the from the simply side, at least it helps. You've got a couple of things that are really drafting off of what was a you know a unique year. Right. And Ed, when you from the European perspective, when you look at the US market, what are you looking for this year for indicators? Yeah, I mean the 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 US is it's quite a different market relative to Europe and a lot of the global markets. You know, 
when you look at the last three, four years or so, frankly, you know, global beer has been in a bunker. Yeah, they've been under siege. You know, we've had, you know, a lot of the emerging markets had no stimulus. You know, livelihoods were lost. People really hit rock bottom. A bunch of the breweries were shut, you know, Mexico, uh, South Africa. Um, and then just as we were getting back on our feet, inflation went and walloped beer again. And then just as that was coming to an end, Russia, Ukraine, and, and Europe got hit really, really hard by that. And the brewers were forced to take an inordinate amount of price, you know, at least 2x what, what you guys saw, you know, within the US. And now you get into that inflection where, you know, wage growth is starting to exceed inflation. So real disposable income is going to be going. So actually, I think the US is going to be, you know, lacking catalysts in terms of good news. And in that respect, relative to a lot of global beer, where we're hitting easy comps and, you know, pricing is coming down. But look, I think from ABI's perspective, you know, when you you know put it in the context of you know that business, which is very meaningful for them still, and it's a you know big must-win market, um, you know, had um, you know the controversy not happened last year, which cost them a billion dollars of EBITDA, they would have had a pretty good year, and the share price would have been in a very different place. So it's almost I wouldn't say it's a payback year, but I think it's almost viewed as a bit of a comeback year, um, you know, for these guys with a lot of the parts of the business moving in the right direction. And margins, frankly, moving the right way for them in a bunch of territories, whether that's Brazil, whether it's Mexico, whether it's Europe, whether it's Colombia, Peru, margins are going to go up. And that's going to give them quite a lot of firepower, frankly, to go after the U.S. So I know we're really, um, you know, watching the U.S. with, you know, very, very closely to see what happens um, to both the market and also the competitive dynamic. Um, and look, the market in terms of the investment community you know, it doesn't know how to model this. And they're just looking at a flat Bud Light ABI US portfolio. So anything um, in excess of that, any volume growth that you see, um, you know, will really, um, you know, be celebrated, I think, you know, by the investment community. Why are the margins better? Is that because COGS has come down? Energy or? Yeah, what? it's a, it's a combination. Remember, Europe, um, you know, given proximity to Russia, Ukraine, you know, the energy price went up 10 times or so. Um, and that put a huge amount of pressure on both on glass and also, you know, cost of production. Um, and then, you know, barley again, you know, there were restrictions on what could be sold out of Russia, Ukraine. So look, huge pressure on barley. So and barley tends to be quite localized. So Europe is quite specific in that both energy and and the, the key raw mat um, in terms of barley, you know, went up much higher than a lot of the other areas. And then around, you know, the rest of the world, currencies devalued a lot, which then gets put pressures on on commodities, especially that the hard currency denominated ones. And a lot of that's reversing now. So, you know, uh, ABI's Brazilian subsidiaries, you know, talking to, you know, COG collectors down zero to minus three, you know, inflation is still up three or four. So they're going to get gross margin expansion. And again, that's going to give them quite a lot of firepower, frankly, um, you know, to focus on the US. And I think, you know, part of being a global business gives them that luxury to be able to really go after the U.S. in a way that, you know, maybe if they were just a U.S. business, they, they, they might not have been able to do. Right. And that that's really a departure because usually I think net dollars flow away from the U.S. <clears throat> to invest in higher growth markets historically. But this is a unique position because, you know, AB lost over four share points and that's that kind of resets the table, right? What AB's lost, Molson Coors and others have gained and then they gained that operating leverage you know they get to molson coors gets to spread the cost their fixed cost over more barrels is it that much i i don't know but one of the things that the u.s market i think and i, I want to ask you guys about this one of the things we don't have right now at the moment is pricing power because we've just taken big price increases and beer has out out uh, outpaced wine and spirits for the last 10 years Comil, what do you agree that this is going to be a tough pricing environment for beer? I think the year will be characterized by the marketing dollars that are spent, but not at all by pricing anymore. If we could kind of summarize, since COVID, you had a COVID year, a reopened year, supply chain access restrictions for all kinds of things, whether it's cans or, or labor, was your sort of supply chain year. Then we had inflation and we had the Bud Light. Uh, I think the story of what will be the next 12 months is going to be a lot more on the investment side. And so it was a really tough, you know, we think about easy comps, but how far back do you go? Do you go to 19 or 18 when each of these years we've had something 
um, very, very substantial sort of swinging the performance of the industry. But now it does get to a little bit more of the, the actual selling playbook. Who's going to win feature and display will make a difference. The marketing perspective, just like, you know, I'm going to repeat what I'd said because it's important, losing a billion dollars of EBITDA, that's larger than the profitability of most of these other countries. So they could be growing faster or maybe you know, they could have the opportunity to grow faster for some long period of time. But getting back as much as you can of that billion dollars of EBITDA, probably pretty good, too. And so right. I do think this sort of refocus on the industry, one of two things happen. One is, and this is what you frequently see, is when everyone in the industry starts investing more on trying to drive top line, the category does better. That is what right. we're doing. Like what we don't know for sure if that second part's going to happen, but I think we do know that the companies are spending more on their categories than they perhaps were before. If it doesn't work, then maybe yeah. there is an even bigger problem <laughs> because <laughs> money doesn't solve the issue. Sometimes it's confusing for a finance type, but sometimes it doesn't work. And then there's something bigger and broader that needs to be done. What about Boston Beer? Um, you know, they obviously had a good quarter, but a lot of that's Easter timing. I think going forward, it's going to be rough for them. What What are your ideas on on Boston? I think that there are hard ones to bet against. There's, you know, you can sort of sometimes just look at craft and look at some things, and it's easy to just conclude that they're going to be in, you know, in a lot of trouble for a while. But they always seem to find something. And it does feel like the rate at which innovations are contributing or becoming relevant in overall beer is increasing. Right. So with the distribution point gains, you know, four or five of the last 10 new um, largest number of points of distribution gained are brands that haven't been around for longer than a couple of years. And so if that's what, if this is going to be an industry that fragments, if it's going to be an industry where innovation becomes even more relevant, than it would have been five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if that's where we are, then they they have a process to find the things that are relevant, probably linked to just how much they spend on salespeople to get their innovations to the front. They don't have to invent this new thing, but they can become really relevant in that category. And so, right. yeah, there's some issues at the moment, but um, feels like the industry is moving more in their direction than away from it. Yeah, I mean, for the near term, it kind of depends on if Twisted Tea can hold on to at least their share, they're good, they're good fast followers, right? They 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 see what's kind of growing on the margin and then they jump in big time. I would say that right now, the kind of the fastest growing third party indie drink would be Surfside, uh, which is a vodka based tea that's on fire on the East Coast, and Boston Beer is right there uh, with a almost identical product. Uh, that they're rolling out currently. I forget the name of it. It's like, Sun Cruiser. Yeah, Sun Cruiser. Same colors. Looks you know, very similar can. And so uh, we'll see how that that pans out. What other um, like what other macroeconomic headwinds or tailwinds do you see for beer in the U.S.? Relative to a lot of other economies globally. I mean, the U.S. is in pretty good shape, but we're still... I think, as you said at the start, we're still dealing with, to a certain extent, a little bit of post-COVID, not trauma, but, you know, explaining why, you know, things are not back to normal. And, you know, I think people are trying to, you know, feel their way through, you know, what's actually happening from a consumer standpoint. But, you know, it feels like when you look across a lot of consumer staples, you know, not just, you know, within beer, that aspirational consumer that may maybe overextended themselves a little bit during the pandemic, um, called the aspirational, called the occasional, you know, you're starting to see that give back. And, you know, you're seeing that no more clearly than in spirits, right? You know, spirits was a big COVID winner. People stayed at home, drank a lot more spirits. Um, they traded up. They made a ton, a ton of cocktails. The home inventories, you know, really expanded, you know, quite materially. And now you're paying the price for it. The pendulum's swinging all the way back. And, you know, the destocking is going to continue for, you know, probably another couple of quarters or so. So, frankly, you know, relative to that and, and and wine's also having quite a tough time you know beer's not in as bad shape um i know your sort of question there are question marks around the pricing environment but it is a very consolidated market relative to a lot of other global markets i mean you have to have a look at the uk market there's about 10 people fighting it all out i mean the pricing power is very 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 limited so yes there's a little bit of doom and gloom out there but i think on a, on a relative basis it's actually a bit more steady state 
And, you know, certainly when you look at the ABI side of things, I mean, the comps are very easy and you know, the opportunity for them to get a little bit of volume growth, you know, back in is certainly there. Um, I think outside of that, you know, one of the themes that I think is being asked a lot is, or certainly by, by investors, is, you know, to what extent can zero alcohol beer, which has been hugely successful within Europe, to what extent can that be replicated in the US? And, you know, clearly you're seeing Athletic, you're seeing Heineken Zero, you know, really start to get some traction. But, you know, it's still early days on that. But again, that would be quite interesting because, you know, the questions never really go away. They seem to come around every year. You know, are people drinking less? You know, where is alcohol? Where does that fit in in the whole world health and wellness thing? So I think like zero alcohol is kind of quite interesting to watch. You know, we've seen some markets, certainly in Europe, get to 10, 15 percent of the beer industry as zero alcohol. And the stigma associated with it is completely gone. So I think that's quite an interesting thing to watch as well, I think, as we get into 24 and beyond. We are starting to hear as more and more of the consumer companies are giving are reporting their first quarter numbers. You're starting to hear the beginning stages of pressure at the low end consumer, lower income consumer. Mm-hmm. So we might be at the beginning there, um, not fully, but we might be getting close. Yeah, I feel like I've been saying that for two or three years, and then somehow the consumer finds money somewhere and is continuing to spend. It's unbelievable. What about M and A? Are, are we done with that? With big brewers buying smaller brewers, is is it is the trend going toward just trying to create new to life, new to world products internally rather than trying to buy products? Probably a couple of years away from when we go into a second wave. So you have a lot of entrepreneurs, many of which you had at your conference. Um, some of them are going to become really big, really successful businesses, and they're doing things that. The large companies often will struggle to to have the patience in order to let the brand marinate like it needs to. They would like to scale things up very quickly because they're nearly guaranteed distribution. But there's a lot of new smaller entrepreneurs, new to industry folks, and some of these are really going to work. And you'll probably walk or will probably walk into a second wave. It was craft, whatever years ago, eight years ago, and it will probably be beyond beer, the mix of things, whatever however you want to define it in that next one. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things that confuses a lot of people is the difference between malt and wine-based products and spirits-based products. Komil, what 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 are your uh, uh what are your kind of you always have like a unique perspective on the US beer market. Like what do what have you been thinking about for this year? I think the biggest thing is going to be this shift in the retailer's mindset from being annoyed with ABI to trying to figure out how to help them. And, you know, it didn't happen right away, obviously, and it took too long, obviously, but, but I do think we're there now. And mm-hmm. it might all happen simultaneous to the big step up in investment spending simultaneous to that will, is likely also to be um, a company that naturally has a portfolio of sub premium brands that may become a focus if this low income consumer thing continues over right. the course of the year. I think the suppliers will be, compelled to reinvest gross margin benefit into advertising and selling. So where the price of some of these cogs start to come off, and if you're not really moving a lot of volume, you're going to want to take some of those savings and roll it down. You're seeing it in other categories at the moment. I think we'll see it here as well. And if they can do that to move cases, prices get to stay where they are. And that's probably the biggest, as it relates to thinking about the next couple of years of beer, the most important thing that needs to be accomplished in 24 is making sure prices don't go down. And I would say the liquor guys have more to fear about that than than the wine or than the beer guys do. Ed, do you cover um, Diageo? I do, yeah. What What do you think? How, what is their outlook? Well, you, you've just got a huge hangover, frankly, Harry. I mean, you know, the industry used to grow four to five for the best part of, you know, 20 years for you know, a number of reasons, you know, the regulatory piece, the advertising piece, just the spirits sort of getting their mojo. Um, and then you went to a period of 8% growth for three years, you know, overconsumption as, as we sort of talked to. And what's interesting is that a lot of those gains have been given back, yet the industry is not going back to growth. And, you know, part of that is, you know, destocking that's happening, you know, through the supply chain, wholesale, retail, and even the end consumer with home bars. But part of it as well is, I think, you know, just 
spirits based ready for drinks. I think uh, not suffocating, that's too strong a word, but certainly getting in the way, I think, a little bit of distilled spirits growth. And in an environment where there isn't any natural growth and there isn't any natural premiumization, you know, that does argue more for, you know, price promo. And when, you know, these spirits companies are under pressure, you know, because the reporting has been poor for you know, 12 months or so, got some change of leadership there as well. You know, they've got to make numbers. And, you know, the best way to make numbers is to, um, you know, be a bit more promotional. Um, so I think that dynamics playing out as to sort of how how long it lasts for is a little bit unclear. I suppose it depends on, you know, how quickly the growth comes back. But, um, yeah, some quite big strategic question marks because ultimately the U.S. is the lifeblood of Diageo. It's nearly half the business. It's what makes Diageo, in theory, a much more interesting company than a lot of its peers because of that big U.S. structural premising growth engine and hard currency cash. Um, and if that's not working, that's that's quite tricky. Just coming back to the, the last point that, that Kum was talking to on, 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 on price and promo, you know, at the end of the day, it is still a relatively consolidated market. You know, there's a lot of, there's a billion dollars EBITDA to, to regain. And, you know, clearly some of that could come come back for ABI with the operating leverage as the volumes start to tick up, um, if that's going to play out that way. Um, but I, I think, you know, beer generally is, is will be relatively promotion will be relatively rational and i think a lot of the really tricky you know promotional markets you know think about russia in the old days i think you know a lot of those have sort of gone away and you know the, the industry is more consolidated relative to to what it used to look like so i think yes a bit more promo, promo around activation but i don't think it's going to be an irrational beer industry um to to, to really see you know revenue back to, to go negative right it's helpful mm. that if uh if Constellation is now the leader, the price leader, or the one that can drive the bus a little bit more, it's helpful that they seem to be quite rational in that one to two zone, not like what we saw in recent sort of periods. Um, but it's also a rational player that sells at a higher price than most of the rest of the industry. Right. One of the structural differences between beer and wine spirits also is that beer only lasts 120 days. And so, you know, like when we had that huge seltzer hangover, a lot of that beer was crushed and you just don't see that in wine and spirits. It lives on and on and on. And it, you know, they, when you have a over inventory problem, it's, it's not a matter of just uh, bringing it back to the warehouse and drain pouring it. I'm sorry for them. We, you know, we had a great year in 2020, but, but a lot of it ended up in the drain. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I'm, not, I'm not sure the census bureau is, is calculating how much we drain poured. <laughs> So, you know, it's not all of it ended up in, in urinals is what I'm getting at. So, uh, the, the numbers can sometimes distort themselves. Well, let's, let's get back to, to Constellation. I mean, they have tough comps too, and not as dramatic as Molson Coors, but certainly they had a great year. Where do you, where do you see them, uh, uh, ending up in 2024 given the current trends already? I don't see much of a slowdown there, especially as all of the innovations collectively, the contribution of all of it together. We could look talk about Oro or you know some of the individual brands, but I think this portfolio has much more growth now being generated from innovations than what the business used to be five years ago. And if you worry about the mm -hmm. law of law, large numbers types, I shouldn't even not just five years ago, ten years ago too. And so as you're getting towards the law of large numbers, it's going to become more and more critical to have innovations as contributors. And it was kind of hard to predict if it was going to work or not. But yeah. now that we can look back at how, not all of them, but you can look back and say, you're getting a pretty good kicker here. Chilada may be being the best example, but you're helping to support high single digit growth, which the building blocks for a constellation is a little easier, just with their little bit better, little bit better population growth, the one to two on pricing, you don't have to work that hard to get to them being able to do a mid to high single. Right. I agree totally. I mean, you know, plus we mustn't forget that they had a, a major keg shortage last year, which they seem to have fixed. And kegs, you know, kegs equate to a lot of cases. What is what do you think like personally like with the Sands brothers finally kind of giving up some of the control? Does that 
uh, in, uh, from a governance standpoint, is that helpful? From an investor perspective, I think it's absolutely because you, if you're an investor in a company that where the decision making sits only in the hands of a few people, that business is worth less to you because you don't have the ability to vote on if Canopy is a good deal or a bad deal or whatever, whatever the topic. A canopy was a great deal. It, it, it's Comil. It was just, you know, 20 years too early. Well, uh, we'll do the math on that later. <laughs> but, you know, so now, you know, the business is worth more because you have a voting say in what, in what they do with their capital. They generate a lot of cash. You know, so despite massive, you know, whether it's Ballast Point or BRL Hardy or Canopy, despite very, very large losses of capital, they still generate enough cash to be able to continue to invest in the beer business. And in many ways, you could kind of get the point if you're the Sands family and you're thinking long term, you're looking like, well, beer hasn't really grown in 20 years. We have this business that's spitting out tons of cash. Let's figure out how to put that cash into something that should grow. And um, they just picked many of the wrong things. Right. <laughs> and so now yeah. I just think it's a little bit more of an open, you know, they've been pretty clear to say they don't want to do very large deals and don't expect a whole lot transformational or anything like that. Um, yeah. But the bigger debate we're having amongst investors is what they're going to do with wine and spirits. And I think the big struggle there is while they have a bunch of pretty cool brands, Woodbridge is right in that zone of wine that's struggling the most of that sort of price tier. Yeah. And it's very, very big. So it's quite difficult to peel it out. And anybody who's big enough to buy it will also have an antitrust issue. Right. Because of the size, just like they had to extract a few brands from the original deal with the original group of brands they wanted to sell to Gallo. Right. I mean, no, for, you know, you have the problem of first, nobody wants them. <laughs> Second, the maybe who the few players that may want to fill a hole in their portfolio can't do it for any trust reasons. And, and, and then, you know, the, I guess private equity, it would be an option, but that seems janky at this point, nice. but yeah. certainly as a drag, it, it's funny you say, you know, the beer industry isn't growing. So we need to find things that are, but you know, right now it's just invest back in the beer industry because they, they like you said, they still have run room just on, uh, effective distribution they still have run room uh especially on like pacifico for instance they have to manage their capacity with the pace at which they do that so they're they may be it was hard to know this for sure but they may already be at sort of the max amount of reinvestment based on what their capacity currently looks like obviously right. they overdid it on the kegs <laughs> yeah well what they could do is fake everybody out and build a fake brewery, start to build it, put a billion dollars in, and then say, no, we're not building a brewery there and just go build a brewery somewhere else. It is amazing. From the West Coast to the East Coast? Yeah. It is amazing that you can make billion dollar mistakes and it's just not even a problem. You know, it's just, yeah. You know, a billion dollars isn't what it used to be. Let's just face it. I well, mean, it's, it's the, the billion dollars is a, it's an interesting number because when Diageo, spent a billion on on uh, George Clooney's tequila Casamigos you know there was a similar reaction and they actually they they they, they made 10x on the sales okay it's rolling over yeah. now for different reasons but I think when big to to come earlier point you know we're all the big companies are all a bit desperate for growth um you know, Constellation's got the natural runway but a lot of the big companies are you know looking for that they, they're not particularly good at incubating there are a few examples of you know companies doing it off their own bat but um desperate for growth and the risk reward if they get it right is asymmetric um right. and you know but you have to be a big company to to go and throw a billion dollars at you know at something that may or may not work yeah. the, the yeah. early returns can usually be a distribution story kind of like bacardi with gray goose They're like all right we'll just push it eastward or westward i can't remember which direction they had to go get their returns but creating creating your own gray goose at a large company uh, in these larger businesses is tricky Best example I could come up with, Ed probably has more, would be maybe Bullet as being homegrown and built right. out to scale. With, right. with very little innovation, you know, only right. three three brand brand lines, no innovation, very different to Crown. Um, but look, it's, I, I know there's a lot of doom and gloom, but there's quite a bit of vibrant stuff going on in beer globally. 
you know, Guinness, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Guinness in Europe is on fire, right? And it's quite a, you know, it's a tricky taste profile. It's not for everyone, but yeah, young, old, male, female. And I, I don't know what the catalyst is, but, you know, social media, experiential marketing, that's what's really done it. You know, people are taking pictures of the, you know, the most beautiful pint of Guinness, put it on Instagram, and, and the thing's sort of feeding itself. So Guinness is, you know, phenomenally strong at the moment. And maybe there's a bit of nostalgia that's going on in Europe around Guinness and, you know, something you can only have in the on trade. I mean, Molson Coors is Madri uh, in, in the UK. It's just been a phenomenal success, completely made up brand, um, you know, hit a million hectoliters, you know, overnight. Um, you know, there are some some good innovation sort of examples globally. So I, I think there are opportunities. It's just trying to find what works in, in whatever particular market that is that's going to resonate and, and and really get things going but i'd love to see you know the 90s nostalgia of beer really come back in the us um I, I, that, that, that would be great. I, I think it's ripe for it honestly let's talk about heineken real quick before we sign off um heineken usa seems to be adrift it's an importer that is dead set on promoting green heineken leading the tip of the spear for them and i understand why because heineken is their by far their largest selling brand in the U.S. But what's growing in the U.S. is Mexican beer. And, and they own Dos Equis and, and Carta Blanca and Bo Bohemia. And, and, you know, they have the kind of the same portfolio that Constellation has. But it seems to me like they might be missing a big opportunity in the U.S. What, what are your guys' uh, opinion of how Heineken's handling their U.S. market? Yeah, it's been, it's been, you know, a long history of, you know, many years where this was the biggest you know export market for Heineken um by 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 a long way and and I think you know when the brand became sort of a little bit more ubiquitous lost its exclusivity lost its sort of super premium price point that's when it, I think was the sort of not the beginning of the end but that's when it started to drift a little bit for the Heineken brand um they're trying to shore it up with Heineken silver you know clearly a lot of money's gone behind that um you know big Persians you know big Sort of desire to reinvest behind that brand but yeah look it's still a little bit too early to see sort of whether that's going to be the big catalyst that, that drives success i mean heineken zero i think is going well in the us albeit off a small base but look, you make a really good point in that you know mexican beer mexican everything's on fire frankly in the us but it's all constellation you know i think you know the the most interesting man losing that was um a bit of an inflection point, I think, for Dos Equis. And then I think Tecate is just not as, you know, it's, it's a pretty attractive beer in Mexico, but it's just a bit too mainstream, I think, within uh, within the US. The Tecate light's not really um, resonating. So, yeah, the momentum's not necessarily there. Um, the brands are not as, I guess, they're not resonating as well with the consumer as they probably should be. And, yeah, it's all a constellation game. So I'm not sure what the solution is. I mean, it's, remember, Heineken's US business, is all in import, so they don't have the same operating leverage constraints that some of the others have. So volumes go down five, profits probably go down five. They don't go down fifteen, which is what would happen if you if you've got a big fixed cost base. So Dolph's actually got a little bit of time on his hands to decide what to do, you know, with the US and let it play out. And I think you know, Heineken's one of those businesses that likes to take, I think, quite a long term view. They're not going to do anything knee jerk. And look, if they're gonna, if they've got a current strategy. They're going to give it a couple of years to see if it works uh, before pivoting. Right. I think they're doing all the right things, you know. Uh, well, you were at F1, and I was at F1, and and I was there with Heineken, and and uh, they covered the the event. I mean, it was plastered everywhere, and they're into soccer. You know, they're 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 not doing the the whole NFL, NBA, UFC triumvirate that other big brands all seek after they they also lack scale honestly they they lack portfolio scale going to a chain you know they they have dos Equis and heineken basically and whereas constellation can go with a, a broader por portfolio and, and more programs so um that's my two cents on it uh okay so i think we've covered everything. is there anything else that i haven't covered comil that no i mean you know soft drink guys i think have worked out what their strategies are going to be and how they want to be in involved here obviously coke and pepsi took two different routes and now they're using the same route yeah 
Uh, you know, speaking of dead bodies piling up, there's a lot of dead bodies of people trying to crack the three tier beer distribution system in the U S and, uh, that's literally been going on since I've been covering the beer industry, which is going on 25 years, bring, you know, pack a big lunch. All right, guys, well, listen, I really do appreciate you both being on here. It was so good to meet you, Ed, back in Miami last year and, uh, Comil, it's good to see you again, as always. Have a good weekend, and uh, we'll see you down the road. Talk to you. Thanks, Harry. Take care.